Uh, we are honored today to have Dr. Gary Beshein. Um, he spoke last year and has returned again. He volunteers with Doctors Without Borders, and this is his story about um, the volunteer work that, and experiences that he had uh, after the two nine point Eight point nine one. Eight point one. Uh, sorry, devastating earthquakes in Nepal in, Nepal in 2015, and what struggles they had in their relief efforts. There will be time for questions and answers at the end. All you need to do anytime is click the chat button, and you can type in your question there. Let's all welcome Dr. Bashain. Thank you, Leslie. It's good to get to speak to Mirabella Group again about my past work with Doctors Without Borders. I had hoped to again get to meet some of you personally, and I didn't imagine I would be speaking in this format. I hope that you are all safe and managing reasonably well during this pandemic. Since some of you may not be familiar with the scope of Doctors Without Borders work, I'd like to begin by showing a short video that tells their story better than I can. Doctors Without Borders, also known internationally by our French name, Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF, is an independent medical humanitarian organization. Founded in 1971, MSF won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999. Today we have some 33,000 staff on the ground in roughly 70 countries. We work in communities affected by war, natural disasters, disease outbreaks, chronic neglect, and other crises. We treat people based on medical needs alone, regardless of race, religion, or political affiliation. On any given day, we assist patients who have no other access to healthcare services. Our medical teams can offer critical services such as surgery, maternal care, vaccinations, and mental health counseling. When people are forced from their homes, we focus on treating illnesses and injuries. We work to prevent disease outbreaks in refugee camps and other settlements. We treat malnutrition and the consequences of sexual violence. Our advocacy message is always the same. People at risk should be able to access health care and medical workers, even in active conflict zones, must be able to provide it. And life-saving medicines and vaccines must be affordable and accessible for the people who need them most. The ongoing support of our donors, together with the profound commitment of our aid workers, will allow MSF to provide independent and impartial assistance to people in crises for a long time to come. We know that the future holds many challenges for people around the world, but we also know what's possible when we go where we're most needed with the materials we need to deliver life-saving medical care. Like in the video, I will refer to Doctors Without Borders by its French initials, MSF. Today, I want to talk about the 14th of my 15 overseas missions with MSF, which was in Nepal, shown here. I was there for about six weeks, about four months after the big earthquakes. This was the third post-earthquake assignment that I had with MSF. My first was in the Aceh province of Indonesia, the western tip. Uh, some 10 months after the, the big earthquake there and the huge tsunami that occurred on Christmas Day in 2004. Then in January 2010, I was in the first response team that arrived in Port-au-Prince, Haiti after their big earthquake. We got there just 48 hours after the quake. That was my most intense experience of my 15 missions. Like in Indonesia, but unlike in Haiti, uh, my Nepal assignment was, was late. Sorry. This was an easy assignment for me medically because uh, the 
acute event was over and plans were already in progress to turn the project over to uh, another organization that was going to run it on a long-term basis at the end of the year. By way of background, Nepal is a roughly rectangular landlocked country about the size of our state of Arkansas. It's surrounded on three sides by India and on the fourth side by the Tibet region of China. Has a population of about 31 million. Of Kathmandu is a little over a million, the capital. It has eight of the world's 10 highest mountains, but its low point is just above sea level and 75% of the country is mountainous. It's among the poorest and least developed countries outside of the desperately poor countries of Africa. 25% of the people live below the poverty line. It has limited natural resources of quartz, timber, hydropower, and scenic beauty. Hello. It's, it's civilization dates from some 2,000 years ago. There are 125 different ethnic language groups. The religion is 80% Hindu, 10% Buddhist, 4% Muslim. It has a turbulent political history, even in recent times. Uh, this is Kathmandu, the capital. Uh, this is Cherokot, where I worked, and that's about halfway along the line from Kathmandu to Mount Everest that's located here. The first quake hit west of Kathmandu on April 25th, 2015. Killed more than 5, 9,000 people and injured more than 23,000. 19 of those people died on Mount Everest in an avalanche that was triggered by the earthquake. 48 hours after the quake, MSF team arrived in Kathmandu and conducted assessments by helicopter. It was a logistical nightmare. MSF had no prior experience in Nepal and they weren't able to use fixed wing aircraft because there were no airfields to land in the mountains. Uh, nevertheless, MSF by, by May 3rd set up a temporary tenant clinic and by May 8th, hospital with an operating theater and emergency room, etc. They uh, also provided a water supply to 7,000 people in Kathmandu who lost it and provided sanitation to a number of displaced persons camps around there. Most of the early air evacuations were organized by the military from Nepal the U.S. and other countries. There was a big U.S. Marine Corps Her Huey helicopter that crashed near Charicot where I was, killing Marines and two Nepali soldiers. Leslie, your audio is still on. Then 17 days later, a second earthquake hit that was almost centered in Charicot, the town where I was. And on June 2nd, an MSF chartered helicopter on its way back to Kathmandu crashed, killing the pilot and three of its workers, including two Nepali men and one Dutch woman. I arrived in September in Kathmandu after a briefing session at the headquarters in Brussels. It was during the tail end of the monsoon season. I traveled from Brussels with the surgeon and we were each given $10,000 US cash to carry because the project had no bank account and was operating strictly on a cash basis. After a day of briefings in Kathmandu, we were driven to Cher Cherikot. That's a town of about 30 odd thousand at about 5,000 feet altitude. As I said, it was near the epicenter of the second quake. Although it's less than 100 road miles from Kathmandu, it took us 
five hours to get there over a winding mountainous road with washouts in places due to the monsoon. About half of the roadway was only a single lane. We had to sometimes back up the pullouts to allow other vehicles to pass. It's an awesomely beautiful area. If you can see the terracing, that's mostly for family farms for agriculture, and it had one lane roads and footpaths. Few of the houses out of the town had running water, but most had electricity. There were very few private motor vehicles and very few bicycles because of the terrible hills. There was no large scale agriculture at all and no industries. I took this photograph of a family farm just outside of our encampment. The main sources of meat were chickens and people had small herds of goats. There were few cattle and they were used for beasts of burden, for breeding, and for milk. As you may know, Hindus do not eat beef. There was very little in the way of farm machinery, uh, all small tractors like this, and there were no big tractors of any kind. This had been the home of the local agricultural agent who became a friend of mine. It was one of the few houses out of town that actually had indoor plumbing. Uh, he was a well-educated man. He'd been educated in the Netherlands and spoke excellent English. Uh, he didn't have any money to rebuild his house and was living in temporary housing. I'll show you a picture of him later. There was lots of rubble around the area and unrepaired buildings, both in town and out in the countryside. There was surprisingly little reconstruction going on, even months after the event. And the construction methods they used were really primitive by our standards. These women are actually carrying gravel in these baskets up this steep hill to the stonemasons who were working on the building behind them. Most people would use sheet metal and available wood to make temporary houses and shelters for their animals. This woman was lucky. She had her own water supply situated right outside of her house. Most of the women used water supplies beside the road. They'd fill up these containers to take back to their house, wash their hair, and sometimes wash their children. I took these photos along the road that I walked to the hospital every day. I carried a camera with me all the time as there were many opportunities like this to take good photos. The women also had to wash their clothes beside the road. Despite the poverty, the people seemed to be happy and they were very friendly toward me, although I, few if any of them was, spoke English. This house not only had electricity, but had a satellite dish. Like in many third world countries, the countryside was littered with improperly disposed of rubbish. I won't show any pictures of that, but the situation is illustrated by this official sign which was posted near the, on the road near the hospital. To defecate in open areas is to commit a social crime. This was the existing hospital before the earthquake. It's about a half hour's drive from Cherikot town it was not damaged in the quake, but it was too small and poorly served the needs there. This is a new hospital on the edge of town. It was in the last stages of construction when the quake hit. It's basic but sturdy and suffered little damage in the quake. MSF took most of it over, finished it, equipped it and hired the staff. The nurses were mostly from Kathmandu. They were young, inexperienced, but very smart and well-trained and enthusiastic. They had to live in crowded conditions because there was very little housing available for rental after the earthquake. The hospital had open wards and there were a few semi-private rooms for isolation patients. 
Most importantly, there was no intensive care unit. Now, Nepal is listed as one of those countries that has universal health care, but that didn't cover everything. Um, when patients were beyond what we were capable of caring for, we had to refer them to Kathmandu, but uh, the only way to go was for the private ambulance service, which required upfront money by the payment by the family. The trip took five hours to Kathmandu and there was no attendant provided or nurse. And this, this and sometimes death for the patients. The normal life expectancy in Kathmandu is about 72 years, and it ranks on the international scale between Russia and North Korea. Up the hill from the hospital, MSF erected tents for office, pharmacy, and supplies. At the office, they had to keep big wads of cash on hand uh, to pay all the employees who came individually to get paid in cash. Um, interestingly enough, this was a relatively honest area and we had little fear of robbery. We had a fleet of three vehicles. Uh, we had a goodly supply of diesel fuel provided by the UN, even in the fuel shortage that developed. The hospital laundry was in this outdoor temporary building, had electric washing machines, but the drying of all the linens and surgical drapes and surgical gowns uh, was on a line outside. And the surgical linen was then sent to the hospital where it was steam sterilized in a separate facility. We had a modern, fairly well equipped operating room. Uh, we took care of late injuries, general surgical problems of all types, including appendectomies. Uh, we did have to transfer out the severely ill patients because we did have no intensive care unit. The one thing we feared was a mass casualty from a bus accident. Uh, the buses were chronically overloaded and the people on the roof like you see here. Uh, one morning when I was up walking up to the hospital, I encountered this one careening down the road and had a Facebook advertisement on the front. I thought that was make a good picture. Fortunately, a big bus accident never happened. Uh, we did have a small bus accident, uh, but it was nearer to the older hospital than to us and the patients went there. Uh, we did take the opportunity to train the nurses in triage and here are the hospital laboratory was and blood bank was run by the government and we had no control over it and uh, this was a source of frustration to me. Uh, they carried a very small inventory of blood and only the common blood types. I was worried about a disaster and needing a lot of blood quickly and I had, I've had patients die on other missions because we couldn't get blood quickly enough. However, they assured me that they had a walking donor pool that was callable by cell phone and I never got to test that statement. And these two tents were where most of the babies were born. The obstetrical unit was run by the government. MSF provided uh, surgical services, cesarean sections and other surgical services for obstetrics. But these can be life-saving to the baby and mother. This was the chief midwife uh, she's here with her dog with a garland around it. Uh, there was a Hindu festival celebrating dogs that day, and that's why the garland. The general surgeon whom I worked with was not trained in obstetrics, uh, but he was excellent at doing the technical operative procedures of cesarean section and other things. And that's the way 
many MSF missions work where there's no obstetrician available and we would simply perform a C-section when the midwife told us that it was indicated. Here the surgeon is about to hand off a, a baby to the nurse who's holding a sterile sheet to receive it. The mothers I encountered were all in their 20s and they were well nourished. Unlike in places I've been in Africa, I didn't see teenage mothers, nor did I see older mothers who had had many pregnancies and were at great risk for hemorrhage. My impression was that the obstetrical care was much better than what I saw in Africa. However, in checking the statistics, Nepal rakes in internal and in infant mortality and maternal mortality among the more advanced African countries only, and I don't understand why that's the case. The government ran a pediatric and well baby clinic. Uh, there they have a scale to weigh the babies. Um, they also had a nifty gimmick of a, a card that they issued to the mothers at the first prenatal visit. And every time they made a visit, when they delivered in the hospital, they would get this signed off. And uh, at the end, if they completed all the prenatal visits, had a hospital delivery and went to the Well Baby Clinic, they were paid off in a small cash bounty. The clinics were very well attended. One thing you won't see in an American Well Baby Clinic is uh, the medicine they have here, albendazole. Uh, this was given to, to every baby routinely for deworming, much as we would deworm both dogs in our country. This was the compound where we lived. Uh, we lived in tents because, as I said, there was little property available to rent for living accommodations. And also, tents provided the safest place to be in the event of aftershocks, which we had a few while I was there. We were 750 feet down the hill from the hospital, and even there, uh, we were above the clouds on some days. This was our open air kitchen, lounge and eating area. It was a light frame construction with a sheet metal roof. We had an electric refrigerator, running cold water, and propane burners to cook on. That was our cook. These are some of the people who were on the mission. Uh, our, our one nurse was from Zimbabwe. This was the surgeon who's an American. Uh, the administrative boss who's an uh, yours truly. And one of our logisticians who's a Belgian. The uh, Logistician who was the mastermind of putting up this camp was this fellow who was an Indonesian American. Uh, this was the view from that resort. And looking to the northeast, the highest mountain you see there is named Gauri Shankar, uh, after the Hindu goddess Gauri and her consort Shankar. Uh, it's 23,600 feet tall. It's actually visible from Kathmandu. Everest is located behind it and can't be seen. Uh, Nepal Standard Time, which is GMT plus five and a, five hours and 40 minutes, is based on the meridian of its peak. People were almost all Hindu. They were very spiritual. In this whimsical looking temple was located uh, almost next to the hospital. There's the altar in the, in the temple. And here's our German business manager uh, receiving a blessing from the Hindu priest. Down the road about a half hour's walk was a much bigger and more famous temple. Um, there they practiced sac animal sacrifice of goats and chickens, and sometimes there was blood on the floor when I visited there. A lot of bells and trinkets all around. It's typical of these Hindu 
temples. And here I saw a strange looking juxtaposition of symbols, the six pointed star and the swastika. Uh, I realized of course that these symbols don't have the same meaning to the Hindus as they have to us. Here I'm receiving a blessing from another Hindu priest. We were there, there during the Diwali Festival of Lights. It usually lasts five days and represents the triumph of good over evil, truth over falsehood, and light over darkness. And it's traditionally a time for changing, exchanging gifts, something like our Christmas. And they, the towns was lighted up at night and looked for all the world like it was Christmas. Uh, this woman here is buying dye from a street vendor to make up some decorations for the event. As I walked the road from the hospital every day, the children would call out to me. Uh, they call me by name. I don't know how they found out my name. Uh, and they were all willing to pose for me and they were cute. And so I took many pictures of them. This woman lived down the hill from where Lee lived and walked every day in a lame condition with, didn't even own a proper crutch. And we finally got, got her referred for an evaluation for her lameness and uh, at, at least she'd get a fitting of a crutch and maybe there was something else could have been done for her in the way of a brace. I never found out the details. Um, I would see women like this along the road. There she picked up some firewood to bring home and some vegetable material. I don't know what it was. Encountered this couple along the trail out, out for an afternoon walk. And interestingly, the woman brought her knitting and was knitting as she was walking along. One day I saw this huge truck pull up and uh, workmen unloaded these corrugated sheets, sheets one sheet at a time. And what was this all about? Well, after months, the road had just opened up beyond Cherokee, where I was, to even more remote areas. And this was a good, you used as a transshipment point. Uh, and they would bring in smaller trucks to transport the uh, steel to the hinterlands. I thought a... Uh, an interesting, a fitting concluding slide for my talk would be this picture of the back of the truck with this up at the top painted on there. It said, pray for Nepal, we will rise again. This is my last day on the mission. Uh, this is the agricultural agent whom I was talking about and his wife and her, his father. Uh, he asked me to stop on the way out of town and he gave me this garland. So I've tried to show you by example that MSF has the commitment and the know-how to rapidly give aid to some of the most vulnerable people on earth and to be effective under very difficult circumstances. I've been lucky and had the privilege of working with some outstanding international medical teams, but we couldn't have done it without the help of non-medical support, particularly logistical support. MSF is famous for its logistics and support work that enables it to carry on missions that other organizations just can't do. My work with MSF has been my most rewarding of my entire career. And it's left me with some life experiences and some friendships that I wouldn't trade for anything. I am grateful for having the opportunity to tell the story to the people of Marabella. 
I'll be glad to answer questions about the Nepal mission or MSF in general. I will leave on the screen here a statement of the MSF charter, which really tells the story. And I'd like to take a moment to read it, or parts of it. MSF provides assistance to populations in distress, to victims of natural and man-made disasters, and to victims of armed conflict. They do so irrespective of race, religion, creed, or political convictions. MSF observes neutrality and impartiality in the name of universal medical ethics and the right to humanitarian assistance and claims full and unhindered freedom in the exercise of its functions. Members undertake their professional code of ethics and to maintain complete independence from all political, economic, and religious powers. <laughs> 